And for most of my working career, I was very actively involved in doing conservation work in the freshwater fishes of Madagascar. And one of the uh, groups of fish that I became far more acquainted with than I thought I ever would be were Malagasy killies. Well, first of all, to give you some background, right, Madagascar is a large island. It sits in the Indian Ocean off the east coast of Africa. Uh, it's a fragment of the old southern supercontinent of Gondwana land. Uh, it's been isolated for an incredibly long time. Madagascar and India separated from mainland Africa about 120 million years ago, and India split and went its way 65 million years ago. In the intervening time, Madagascar has been sitting isolated in the Indian Ocean. It's been sort of an interesting laboratory for all kinds of evolutionary experiments. Uh, because it's a continental fragment, it's a fairly high island. The capital of Madagascar, Tananarive, uh, in the central highlands, is at the same altitude as Denver, Colorado. Uh, it has a monsoon-type climate, which means moisture comes in from east to west. Uh, as a result of the geography of the island, there's tremendous difference between east coast and west coast as far as habitat, aquatic habitats go. Uh, the east coast is very wet. There is no real dry season on the east coast. There is a wet season and there is a wetter season. Uh, on the other hand, in the rain shadow on the west coast, you have a very pronounced wet season, dry season dichotomy you get four months of quite heavy rain and then eight months where it doesn't rain at all. Uh, the rivers are very different. Rivers on the east coast tend to be very short. They descend very abruptly from the central highlands. They flow very strongly year round. Uh, on the west coast, they descend with equal abruptness, but there's an extensive flat plain that they flow through. So you have a very different structure in terms of uh, floodplain lakes and oxbow lakes. And again, because of the very seasonal pattern of rainfall, you have very dramatic differences between dry season and wet season as far as stream flow is concerned. <coughs> Madagascar lies south of the equator, so the farther north you go in Madagascar, the hotter and wetter it gets. The farther south you go, the cooler and drier. And the extreme south southwestern part of Madagascar is very dry indeed. Uh, it is so dry that you don't have rivers that flow year-round. The rivers down there carry water only during the rainy season. And if any of you are into succulent plants, uh, this part of the world has produced an amazing selection of succulents that have been in, cu in cultivation for many hundreds of years. Madagascar is a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, it has the only part of the world that has more species of orchid per square mile than Madagascar is the island of New Caledonia in the Pacific. Uh, it's a hotspot for chameleons. There's over 60 species of chameleon in Madagascar, there's only about a dozen in Africa, to give you an idea of the difference. Uh, it's an incredible amphibian hotspot. Uh, the, the group that I've been associated with, the Madagascar Faunal Interest Group, manages a little, packet of, little package of relict lowland rainforest on the east coast. It's about 25 miles square. We have inventoried 101 species of frog from that one little patch of forest. So again, uh, it's a real hotspot for amphibian diversity as well. But Madagascar's best known animals are its mammals. Madagascar is home to the tenrex, the most primitive insectivores known. Uh, these animals actually can change their metabolism from warm-blooded to cold-blooded at night. It's a way of saving energy. But Madagascar's best known inhabitants are, of course, the lemurs, or as those of us who work in Madagascar refer to them, the tree poodles. Uh, these are the most primitive living primates. Uh, we've called them tree poodles because unlike most primates, ourselves included, they don't have color vision, but what they do have is a very well-developed sense of smell, uh, which is far more typical of the generality of, of mammals than it is of primates like ourselves. And one of the things that uh, upsets me a little bit, when people talk about conservation in Madagascar, the first reaction is, oh, we have to save the lemurs. Well, I have nothing against lemurs. I have never met one socially that I didn't like. They're very, very amiable animals. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that every species of lemur that was known to science at the beginning of the 19th century is still with us. And as you will see shortly, we cannot say the same thing for the fish. Now, these animals tend to get a fair amount of coverage uh, in various nature programs, and there have been some excellent uh, programs on TV within the last couple of years focusing on the animals of Madagascar. But the beasties that tend to get overlooked are Madagascar's freshwater fish. And they are every bit as interesting and every bit as diverse as the mammals, the frogs, and the chameleons. But again, because fish are underwater rather than on land, they don't lend themselves to television specials quite as well, so the animals don't get the publicity that they really deserve. 
It's an interesting fish fauna. It's dominated by three families, uh, cichlids, the Bedodiidae, the Madagascar rainbows, which are an endemic family. They're native to Madagascar and found nowhere else. And their nearest relatives, interestingly enough, live in Australia and New Guinea. And finally, the Aplicylid killifish. Now, my suspicion is, is that as we explore the island more thoroughly, uh, the number of Ancariot catfish, for example, is almost certainly going to increase, and probably the, the little freshwater gudgeons as well. Uh, these animals tend to live in places where it's not easy to sample, or in the case of the catfish, they tend to be 100% nocturnal, and most researchers and all Malagasy fishermen tend to be 100% diurnal. So there isn't a whole lot of overlap between the two, which means it's kind of easy to miss animals when you're not out there when they're active and doing their thing. Tonight we're going to talk about the killies, and to give you an idea of where they stand with regards to the general world of killifish, they belong to suborder Aplicyloidae, Old World Achilles, uh, family Aplicylidae. Aplicylidae comprises two genera, the genus Aplicylus and Pachypanchax. And then you have the family Nothobranchidae, the African killies, and eight additional suborders. To basically give you an idea of where we are, the Aplicylids are restricted to the Seychelles Islands, Madagascar, and Tropical Asia. Two genera, Pachypanchax and Aplicylus. The Nothobranchia deer are in Africa, and the other Cyprinodont families are scattered throughout Eurasia and the Americas. At one time, we called all of these families Cyprinodontidae, and it's been within the last 25 or 30 years that we realized that this was an inexcusable example of lumping and that these various lineages are distinct and have been so for a very long time. Okay, the, uh, as I say, the, the Aplicylids are strictly limited to uh, tropical Asia, Madagascar, and Seychelles. They are also the most primitive members of the killifish lineage. They are, in every sense of the word, living fossils. All right, obviously this is... Yes, there we go. Uh, Aplicylus have been around in the aquarium hobby for an awfully long time. Uh, they have a mobile upper jaw, like most cyprinodonted fishes do. Uh, the bones that support the tail fin are separate. Uh, the caudal fin is oval shaped and the middle rays are prolonged. Uh, the caudal fin is unscaled, the base of the caudal is unscaled, and there's a reflective shiny pineal eye or spot on the top of the head. And as I say, these are, these are old time friends in the aquarium hobby. Uh, Aplicylus panchax and lineatus have been around since the, the early teens of the, the last century. Uh, Dei and Warneri, which are from Sri Lanka, uh, from basically the 1940s onward. And Aplicylus parvus, the dwarf Aplicylus, is another one that dates back to the, the very, very early years of the hobby in the last century. Uh, nice aquarium fish. They are known vernacularly in Germany as Hechtling, which means little pike, and that describes their behavior towards smaller fish. Uh, Lineatus can get to be almost four inches long, and anything under two inches does not last very long in the same tank with them. It becomes behaviorally and behavioral enrichment, as we say in the zoo and aquarium business. Pachypanchax, uh, the upper jaw is not mobile. It's fixed to the skull. The hypural bones are fused to form a single structure, and this is a unique characteristic in cyprinodontoid fishes, sets pachypanchax apart from all of them. Uh, the caudal fin is rounded, the base of the tail fin is very heavily scaled, and there is no reflective pineal spot. The type species of the genus is pachypanchax playferi, and Playferi is native to a group of islands to the north of Madagascar, the Granitic Seychelles. There are another continental fragment. Uh, there's a single species, or at least we think there's a single species on the Seychelles. They occur on three separate islands, uh, and I wouldn't be too terribly surprised if we looked at the DNA. It didn't turn out there were probably three, three separate species. There were certainly color differences between the islands. Uh, there are seven described and nine to date undescribed Pachypanchax species. And it's rather interesting, uh, the late George Myers erected the genus Pachypanchax for Pachypanchax playferi. And I think he assumed just on the basis of geographical proximity that the genus was found on Madagascar as well. The reason I say this 
is there is no evidence that he ever examined preserved material of any Malagasy Paki Panjaks, and he certainly never visited the island. It just turns out in this case, his inspired guess was right on the nose. They have an interesting distribution in Madagascar, with the exception of one species, Paki Panjaks veratraza, in the northeast. They all occur on the western slope of the island. Uh, we don't know how far south they aboriginally went. We found a relic population in headwater rivers quite far south. We've never found them in the area where the question marks occur, and I've looked for them. Now, whether they were there at one time and they have disappeared, because that area is heavily infested with introduced mosquito fish, uh, or whether they were there at one time and when things became drier, they were pushed up into the mountains, we just don't know. But the red indicates the known actual range of the genus in Madagascar to date. You will notice they have an, an almost completely antithetical distribution to the Bedodia species. Uh, they occur, or they occupy pretty much the same niche. They're both small fish that tend to rely heavily on stranded terrestrial insects for their food. So again, whether this is a historical accident or whether this represents actual ecological exclusion, at the moment we just don't know. Uh, as I say, the, these animals, for the most part, have all been discovered fairly recently. Uh, the first, actually the first Malagasy freshwater fish ever described was a Pachypanchax. Uh, it was described uh, between, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, a couple of them were described shortly after the turn of the century, and then pretty much none of them were discovered until relatively recently. And the reason for that, quite simply, is that when you take pachypanchaks and put them in alcohol, they turn into little brown fish. You have to have live animals to realize that you're looking at very different fish. And it wasn't until relatively recently, when aquarists like myself started poking around in Madagascar, that we realized we were looking at a far more complex picture than the previous published literature had led us to believe. From the standpoint of aquarium husbandry, these are the perfect beginner's killie. They are absolute industrial strength. Uh, they are not particularly tolerant of cool water. The only exception to that is Pachypanchex saccharamii that should have a period of temperature in around 65 for a couple months during the winter. But other than that, they are, as you would expect, uh, low, from lowland tropical fish, uh, they don't tolerate chilling terribly well. But other than that, uh, water chemistry, wet. Uh, they live over a wide range of water chemistries in Madagascar proper, from soft and acid to quite hard and alkaline. And they adapt quite nicely to just about any tap water they're going to find in, in, uh, in captivity. Uh, they are definitely not picky feeders. They will eat anything that floats. I have had pachypanchaks freshly caught in Madagascar eat tetramen within two hours of being put in a bucket and beg for food within two days after being brought into captivity. Uh, so picky feeders, they're not. Uh, if you want to bring them into breeding condition and keep them there, it's strongly advisable to give them a lot of frozen uh, or live food. But as far as maintenance go, standard flakes work perfectly well, and they will certainly take things like freeze-dried krill and freeze-dried bloodworms very readily. Uh, they're fairly large killies. Uh, I would say if you want to breed them on a single pair basis, if you'd want to at least use at least five gallon tank. And you can certainly keep a group of them quite comfortably in a 15 or 20 gallon tank without any problems at all. Unlike Pachypanchax playferi, which is frankly something of a thug, and the males do fight quite, aggr quite, quite aggressively uh, if they're crowded, uh, this is not the case with Pachypanchax. You can keep a multi-male, uh, multi-female group together, and all you'll have is very ritualized fin flaring, no serious fighting, no fin damage, nothing. Uh, that separates them, I think, quite dramatically from their Seychellois congener. Uh, they are not particularly predatory. Uh, I've kept them with smaller fish and had no problems at all with the mysterious disappearances. They're not fin nippy. You can keep them with a wide range of other community fish. They are exceedingly easy to breed, short of physically separating the sexes. If you keep these fish in a planted tank and feed them well, you will have babies whether you want them or not. Uh, the parents do not eat their eggs, nor do they eat their newly hatched fry. What typically happens if you keep these things in a single species tank is the first hatch batch of fry will tend to bushwhack the subsequent ones as they, as they hatch out of the eggs. So if you want to produce these animals in quantity, uh, it pays under these circumstances to be a little bit more interventionist as far as their management goes. 
Uh, the lazy man's way to breed them is essentially set them up in a tank with a mop uh, for a week or so, take the mop out, put it in a separate tank, let the fry hatch, and then just take it from there. Uh, they are very easy to raise. The young are large enough to take newly hatched brine for their first food. They grow, grow quite rapidly. And these are not annual killies. These are very long-lived fish. The first wild saccharamii that I brought back from Madagascar, I now know based on the size of the fish, were at least three years old and possibly closer to five. I had a female live eight additional years in my tank, and she was producing eggs until, until the month she died. So this, is, this animal was at least 12 years old. So these are long-lived fish. They're not at all like your annual Achilles or some of the shorter-lived non-annual species. So plan on having them for quite a while. They occur in a wide range of habitats. The, 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 the classical habitat that I tend to think of, because this is the, the type locality for the type species of the genus, are small flowing streams. Uh, generally under some kind of forest cover, not necessarily intact, but there's patches of shade. Uh, they also occur in the shallows of large rivers, and they occur in quite acidic swampy habitats in parts of northwestern Madagascar as well. So they're not picky about where they live. And as I say, they are definitely not picky when it comes to water chemistry, because this habitat, for example, Manahoko Creek, uh, there were no detectable dissolved solids, and the pH was 5.0. Uh, Matsubori Farangini, which is a little bit to the north in a drier area, uh, the hardness was on the order of 130 microsiemens per centimeter square, uh, 17 degrees German hardness, pH of about 8.0. And the same species occurred in both habitats. Now, the first Malagasy killi to be introduced into the hobby was this species. And it was introduced to the hobby as Pachypanchax amelanotis. Uh, this, as I said, this was the first Pachypanchax described. In fact, it was the first Malagasy freshwater fish to be scientifically described. And this animal made its debut in the early 1950s, and they, stick, they stuck around until the late 1970s, early, early 1980s. And then basically the aquarium strain died out pretty much at the same time on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think this probably reflected the fact that we simply weren't very good about managing that population genetically. Well, when I started doing work in Madagascar, I, th I thought it would be kind of nice to reintroduce this fish to the hobby. And this particular population was collected from this little Maria Mevatanan in western Madagascar. So I said, well, that's interesting. But being trained as an ichthyologist, I went back and read the original description and discovered that the animal had originally been described from an island off the northwest coast of Madagascar called Nosy Bay. So that's where I went to look for Pachypanchax omelanotis. And what I discovered is that in the type locality, this is what omelanotis looks like. You will have to agree it does not at all resemble very closely the animal we've been calling by that name in the hobby. And this was the point at which it suddenly began to dawn on me that this might be a rather more complex situation with regards to the number of species that the literature would lead us to believe. Uh, this is the red morph of omelanotis in the same creek that you find that animal, and Jabala Creek is the type of locality, as near as we can tell, uh, Nosy Bay is kind of interesting. It has both creeks and a series of volcanic crater lakes. The Achilles are found only in the stream habitats. We've never found them in any of the lakes. And whether this is because they just haven't gotten there, because these are relatively young lakes, volcanic crater lakes usually are, or whether the cichlids in the lake effectively exclude them, uh, you know, there's no way to know. But at least, at present on the island of Nosy Bay, if you want to find Apocalus or other Pachypanchax on Melanotis, you look in the stream. And in Jabala, you have a red form and a yellow form living side by side. In one of the small creeks a little bit to the east and north, uh, Ambato Zavav, you have a blue one and a red one. And again, these animals are living side by side in the same body of water. On the mainland of Madagascar, opposite the island, you have uh, an orange population and a turquoise blue one, again, living side by side. And I was to subsequently discover that this color polymorphism is pretty much a characteristic of a lot of populations of northern Pachypanchak species. And it does make life kind of interesting for the aquarium hobbyist. You can pretty much take your pick of color if you want to work with them. Uh, we tried working out the genetics of this particular situation with homolinotis and drove one of Klaus Kallman's technicians uh, just about up the wall 
uh, we were never able to make any sense out of it. And I think the problem is, regardless of what the males look like, the females all look the same. Uh, so it's very hard to set up a selective breeding program when you don't know what genes the females are carrying. We'll work our way from north to south on the west coast. The next uh, species that was described is a species that has literally disappeared from view. Uh, this is Pachypanchax nuchisquamulatus. The animal is known only from the type specimens. They were collected in the 1860s by a French expatriate uh, who had lived, married a Malagasy lady and basically earned his living by collecting specimens and selling them to museums in Europe. And one year he went on a collecting trip into Western Madagascar and never came back. And unfortunately, he took all of his notebooks with him. So we don't know where in Madagascar the type material of Nuchisquamulatus was collected. And as I say, it's a, it's a good species. Uh, I've seen the type specimen. I've radiographed it. It's got the typical Pachypanchax uh, caudal skeleton, so it belongs to the genus. Uh, but unfortunately, none of the animals that we have collected correspond in any way to the type specimen. So whether the animal is still lurking in some obscure corner of Madagascar and waiting to be discovered, or whether in the intervening time it has gone extinct, which is unfortunately also quite possible, remains to be seen. But all we know is that the animal exists in a bottle in Paris, and that's all we can say about it. The next species was described by a German aquarist on the basis of material that was collected by a sailor from the little town of Sakarami village on the Sakarami River in extreme northern Madagascar. And this is a case where we had the type locality right down to the nearest half mile. When I went back to that type locality to try to collect the fish, all we found were guppies, Mozambique mouth brooders, and a goby. Uh, it wasn't until we worked our way upstream into the headwaters of the Sakurami that we actually found a viable habitat and we found the fish. Uh, as we'll see a little bit later on, this animal used to have a very extensive range in northern Madagascar. It's now, as near as we can tell, restricted to the headwaters of the extreme headwaters of the Sakurami River and two low altitude crater lakes in Montagne d'Ambre National Park. And the reason for that basically is introduced pisciliids, guppies and gambusia. Uh, it's a very attractive fish. Uh, as I say, it's unusual in that it does require a cool water period. Uh, the reason for that is that it occurs at a high enough altitude so that it experiences water temperatures in the mid to low 60s during the austral winter. And if they do not get that particular cool period in captivity, you tend to wind up with problems with bacterial infections and skin problems and the animals just drop off the, the map as far as reproduction goes. Working our way south, uh, this part of Madagascar is characterized by a lot of interesting limestone formations called singi. These are called the dolomite formations in, in Europe. Uh, and basically the hydrology there is very complex. You have a lot of isolated basins that essentially have no outlet. They just flow and disappear underground and then pop up four or five kilometers later. And this area has apparently been a hot spot for Pachypanchax evolution because these populations get isolated and they just go their own separate way without any input from the outside. This is an animal that we discovered at near the entrance of Ankarana National Park. We originally thought it was just a color morph of Pachypanchax omelonotus, and this is why I made no particular effort to breed it. It wasn't until we had a chance to look at the DNA that we realized that it was, in point of fact, not only was it not omelonotus, it wasn't even particularly closely related to it. Uh, I wouldn't particularly mind getting this animal back into the hobby. It's a very attractive fish. But from the conservation perspective, it's in a national park in an area that's not terribly populous and where there hasn't been much to mess up the habitat. So it's actually doing reasonably well in nature. Uh, and consequently, from the conservation perspective, it's not a terribly high priority to get into captivity. Another Ankarana species that we stumbled across when we were looking for the yellow one is this animal. Uh, again, uh, this is red where the other one is yellow. And again, it, we thought it might be a geographical color, or color variant, but again, it's genetically quite distinct. Uh, again, an interesting animal, but not one that I was particularly motivated to bring back because it's in pretty good shape in nature and the habitat isn't going to go downhill very rapidly. The only species that occurs on the East Coast uh, is Pachypanchax varitraza. It occurs in the, the Menamberi Basin, in the, uh, which is located, let's see, right in here. 
And again, it's an animal that's been pushed up into high altitude habitats. Essentially, it's been pushed out of the lowland habitats by gambusia and by snakeheads. Uh, the remaining populations are all above 500 meters above sea level. And my suspicion is uh, once that cloud forest disappears, which it's probably going to, because that part of Madagascar is quite heavily populated and there's a lot of pressure on the surviving forest, uh, this animal is probably going to disappear as well. It's a very robust pachypanchax. Pachypanchax means thick panchax. Pachys is the Greek adjective for thick. And certainly compared to Aplochylus, they are a chunkier looking fish. Uh, we found different populations uh, in the two different <coughs> rivers. The Menomberi population, I think, is the more attractive of the two. It produces this very attractive herringbone pattern in some of the males that you get in captivity. Uh, the Ampanobe population is rather less inspiring as far as markings and coloration are concerned. Uh, these animals are probably floating around. I brought some of them back, and I've, I dispersed them to a number of killifish <coughs> breeders in this area. So these animals may still be floating around somewhere. Moving back to the west coast, the next species south is Pachypanchax patriciae. This is a fish that I described some years ago. I named it after uh, Patricia Yazgi, one of our trustees who supported my research financially quite generously, uh, in addition to which Pat was a very nice, nice lady and just deserved to have a fish named after her. Uh, this animal occurs in the northwestern mainland of Madagascar. It occurs in two color forms. Uh, in the extreme northern part of the range, they all look like this blue form, a very attractive fish. As you work your way south, you find redfish starting to show up. And by the time you get to the extreme southern point where we've collected the animal, the red animals essentially outnumber the blue ones. And again, were it not for the fact that we found these animals swimming together happily in the same body of water, I think you could legitimately be excused for thinking you were different, dealing with two different species. But in point of fact, they are, they are color morphs of the same animal. We have lost the blue animal, but the red morph is still floating around in the killie hobby. Uh, and again, uh, as it is no more difficult to breed than any other pachypanchax, uh, it, it really should be promoted as the perfect beginner's killie. Hardy, colorful, and dead easy to breed. Next river south is the Mevorano River, again, home to a distinctive animal. Uh, this is one that I have never seen a really good specimen of. These are some specimens that were caught by some French aquarists that were working in Madagascar at the same time that I was there. Uh, and the animals were not in terribly good shape when I got them. I photographed them anyway to record the color pattern. But again, on the basis of DNA material, we were able to preserve fin tissue and alcohol and look at it later on. It's an, again another valid species. This animal has a very restricted, or appears to have a very restricted distribution. It's found at the tip of one peninsula in northwestern Madagascar, here. Whether it occurs on the other side remains to be seen, because that area is not accessible by road. And I've never been able to organize a boat to get out there. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a yellow fish, a rather small species. And again, uh, the genetics tell us it's a perfectly valid species. This is Pachypanchax sparksorum. Uh, this is named after uh, John Sparks and his wife, who collected the first live specimens. Uh, it is endemic to the one river system, the Anjingo Ancofia, up here in northwestern Madagascar. And it again occurs in two color morphs. This is the red one, and then they'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the, the, blue, the blue one shortly. A uh, very attractive fish, and again, it's floating around in the hobby as well. Uh, mostly the blue ones, I believe. I haven't seen a red male in many, many years. And this is the type locality, the Anjingo River. This is an undescribed species from the Doro or Lozoa system, the next river to the south. This, I think, is one of the prettiest Pachypanchak species. This is one that I would love to bring back, but have not succeeded in doing so. The downside is that this is the most aggressive Malagasy Pachypanchaks I have kept. This is one in which the males are rather intolerant of one another. And even the females will tend to say rude things to one another if they're crowded. But this is a case where I think it would be worth putting up with a little bit of aggression because it's such an attractive animal. Not a high, terribly high conservation priority, again, because in this particular case, again, the habitat's in pretty good shape and the animal doesn't seem to be under any particular stress. 
Uh, this is not a habitat where snakeheads have, have penetrated yet, and we never found gambusia in the habitat with them. Pachypanchak species Sophia, next river basin to the south. Uh, this is a large species, a very attractive one, and one that's in very serious trouble. Uh, this part of Madagascar has been in a period of prolonged drought, so the habitat has shrunk dramatically, and unfortunately it has to contend with both gambusia and snakeheads. Uh, this is one that I did succeed in bringing back, and I am breeding it. I have them at home, and I've spread them around. Uh, this is an animal that could use all the attention and captivity that we can give it. It's in very much the same situation the Pachypanchak saccharemii is, as far as habitat contraction is concerned. Well, having found all these new Pachypanchak species, I would still wanted to bring back the original one that we had in the aquarium hobby, and that turned into a bit more of an adventure than I thought. Uh, we hit all the streams on the road between Tananarive, the capital, and Maj uh, the uh, Majunga, the main city on the west coast, including habitats where I was sure I would find the original aquarium, quote, Omelonotus, unquote. Well, all we found were sword tails. And it wasn't until after a number of interesting misadventures with professional fishermen that we stumbled across Claude the Butcher, so named not because of his human rights record, but because he is actually the butcher of the town of Antananbar. And he was quite familiar with the fish, it took us to a pandana swamp on his property, and this is where we collect the type species, or the, the type series of what proved to be a new species, Pachypanchax arnolti. Uh, this is an animal that uh, has disappeared from a lot of habitats, but still doing pretty well in marshy areas uh, in the delta region of the Betsy Polka River and the next river to the north. So I don't consider it a terribly high conservation priority. Uh, it is back in the hobby. Uh, Denver Zoo maintains a population. Uh, it's available through the AKA. And, uh, and the Canadian killi people have it as well. It's an attractive animal. I don't think it's as attractive as either Patriciae or uh, Saccharamii, or for that matter, Omelonotus. But it's, it's an interesting animal to have. And this is an amazingly robust animal. I collected specimens of this fish in water with a temperature of 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And the fish didn't seem to be in any sense stressed. They were just swimming around happily, picking food off the bottom, and functioning the way you would expect killies to function. So this is one you don't have to worry about if the heater gets stuck. Uh, they're definitely a heat-resistant fish. Working our way south, I wanted to see how far south Arnolti's range extended. It would have been nice if the animal had actually occurred in more than just one or two river systems. That makes the conservation issues a little bit less pressing. We, worked, we wanted to try the Manambajo River, which is this river system down here. Uh, and again, you approach these rivers by essentially descending from the central highlands and going towards the coast. And what we found is that above waterfalls, you don't tend to get anything except gobies and eels. They're the only animals that can apparently climb up and get into the upper reaches of the rivers. So we weren't terribly successful in finding pachypanchaks, even in what looked like good habitat, above these major waterfalls. Uh, once we got into the, low, the coastal lowland areas, and again, found typical Pachypanchax habitat, we found this very attractive animal. Uh, again, it's a blue Pachypanchax. Uh, once you get south of the Sophia, they all tend to be blue. Uh, you don't get the color polymorphism you get to the north, but it's certainly not Pachypanchax arnolti. It's a slenderer fish, uh, has more pointed fins and a rather different color pattern. And uh, again, um, this is not an animal I saw, I felt particularly motivated to bring back. We found it in two different river basins. The habitat was in good shape, and we didn't find much by way of exotic competitors. So these guys are not a high conservation priority. They're not a bad looking fish, but again, given what was motivating my work in Madagascar, it wasn't an animal that I was particularly motivated to try to bring back. And the same is true from this species, which we found in the Manambola River, the next river to the south. Again, it was pretty much the same situation. Above your major waterfalls, gobies, and it's not until you get below those waterfalls you get a more diverse assortment of fish. And this is the Manambolo Pachypanchax, another blue species. This is a somewhat chunkier fish than the Mahambaho animal. And again, uh, they're all blue. And again, looking at the DNA, they're a fairly, obviously, pretty good species. This is as far south as I have found any Pachypanchax. A French team that penetrated into the extreme headwaters of a major river furthest to the south found relic populations. 
of Ipaki Panchaks. I have never examined that material, and I don't have good color photographs of it. Uh, at the moment, I'm tended, I tend to regard it as a new species simply because this single base in endemism seems to be pretty much the norm for Malagasy killies. But again, that's, that's pretty much an open question. And again, whether this population uh, is a relict population of a formerly more widespread animal, uh, at the moment, it's anybody's guess. Uh, I would love to see specimens of that animal, but uh, they're still sitting in the study collection at the University of Tananarive because the people that collected the specimen were excessively scrupulous about getting permission to export the specimens. Uh, and I would have simply stuck them in a plastic bag, put them in my bag, and taken them home. But again, to each his own. I mentioned earlier <laughs> that uh, unlike the lemurs, which have done pretty well for themselves since the beginning of the, la of the 19th century, the fish had not been quite so fortunate. Uh, we have 4% of Malagasy's, Malagasy's, Madagascar's freshwater fish fauna is defined as extinct. In other words, we haven't seen these animals since 1950. And it's not for want of looking. Uh, it's one of the few places of the world where you have more animals that are classified as endangered or threatened than are considered low risk. And virtually all the fish, half the species known, would definitely fall in the category of vulnerable. And the reason for this is that basically uh, Malagasy fish have had to deal with a number of problems caused by the arrival of Homo sapiens on the island of Madagascar around the second century AD. Uh, the Achilles have been no more fortunate than other groups of fish. Uh, we are pretty sure, I'm assuming that Pachypanchax nucisquamulatus is extinct. That may be, uh, given the fact we haven't seen it since 1860, uh, I think you can reasonably assume it isn't around anymore. Uh, there is another group of Achilles in Madagascar, nominal pantanodon species. These are almost certainly a, belong in a new genus. They don't correspond at all to pantanodon podoxies on the east coast of Africa. But both of those animals have gone extinct since their discovery. And again, we've gone back to the collecting sites. Uh, in the case of pantanodon madagascariensis, I spent three years searching that particular stretch of coastline and could not find it. More to the point, the locals had no idea what I was talking about when I mentioned the fish. And given the fact that they know their fish fauna extremely well, uh, that again suggests to me that this animal is late. Uh, the second species was, a, was found by John Sparks. Uh, he collected preserved material, went back for additional specimens, and it was gone. And this animal was in a nominally protective area. So we, I suspect this animal was a victim of Gambusia. But uh, the problem is most of these animals occur in only one river basin. And by definition, any animal that has a restricted range like this, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature automatically defines as vulnerable. Because if something goes wrong in that habitat, you run the risk of losing the entire species globally. We also have a number of species that are data deficient. We just do not have enough information to classify them one way or another. But my gut suspicion is that if we had that information, that white would probably turn to either yellow or green. The principal threats to Pachypanchaks come from habitat degradation. When the first canoes arrived in Madagascar, the east coast looked like that, the west coast looked like that. It was a forested island. Uh, the central highlands were a mosaic of, of, of scrub, scrubland, forest, and savanna. But the lowland habitats were forested. The problem is that after about a thousand years of this, to clear land, for agriculture and for grazing, most of Madagascar now looks like this. Well, it's pretty obvious that this is not going to be a good state of affairs for things like lemurs or chameleons, which live in forests. But people ask, well, what effect does deforestation have on fish? Well, the answer is very simple. Uh, aboriginally, Malagasy streams look like this. Clear water streams flowing over rocky bottoms, firm substrata, under forest cover. The forest keeps the water clear because it traps rainfall and prevents the rain from washing sediment into the streams and turning them into mud. When you remove a forest cover, what you get is this. Uh, this is the Sambava River, and it represents closely the way the old pioneers described the Colorado. 
too thick to drink, too thin to plow. And fish that have evolved in a very different set of environments, as far as water clarity, oxygen concentration, and bottom type goes, simply can't live in that kind of modified habitat. They're just gone. Uh, there is a Sambava bedodia that's endemic to that basin, and it is now restricted to two little patches of forest about the same size as the parking lot outside this building. Uh, this is a highly endangered bedodia species. Happily, it is now being captive bred in Madagascar. So I think we have a chance of saving it. But this is, it, it, it is in effect the poster child for what happens when deforestation modifies the hydrology of a river basin. And Achilles do not like this any more than Bedodia do. The other problem on the West Coast, remember I mentioned on the West Coast you have sharp seasonality as far as rainfall goes, four months of rain and then eight months of no rain. Well, in a forested habitat, that forest soaks up the rain and holds it like a sponge and then releases that water slowly during the dry season. So that what this means is that even very small creeks can flow under a forest cover during the dry season. When you take that forest away, you take the land's ability to soak up that water and hold it during the dry season. So streams that used to flow permanently become intermittent. They only flow during the rainy season. And when that happens, the fish fauna that lived in that stream becomes toast. It just, it's gone. Because in the last analysis, fish need water. And there are no annual Achilles in Madagascar. Now that Madagascar's Iapocylids have never evolved annualism the way the Nothobranchids have in Africa and the Rivulids have in South America. So the, the, the poster child for this problem is, is basically Pachypanchex saccharamia. Uh, most of the habitats that that fish used to be in, and we know they used to be there because we have museum records dating back to the early years of the 20th century, uh, those habitats were permanent streams then and they're seasonal streams now. The fish have just disappeared. They've been extirpated from those habitats. The other problem that Malagasy Achilles particularly have to deal with is the problem of invasive exotics. The French introduced guppies and mosquito fish as an anti-malarial measure in the 1920s. Now, the logic behind this has never been particularly clear to me. Uh, malaria is not a problem in the highlands of Madagascar where most of the people live because it gets too cold during the austral winter for Anopheles mosquitoes to survive there. And as far as the coastal regions are concerned, there has certainly been no detectable decrease in the incidence of malaria since the introduction of either gambusia or guppies. And I can tell you from personal experience, if you want a larvivorous fish, if you want a fish that will really nail mosquito larvae, you just work at pachypanchaks. Because they will not only take the larvae, they have powerful enough jaws to eat the pupae as well, which gambusia don't. The problem, unfortunately, is that gambusia are much more efficient at eating the juveniles of other fish than they are at eating mosquito larvae. And this is exactly what they've done in Madagascar. Uh, every place I have spoken to people with regards to the disappearance or the extreme reduction in population size for either Bedodia or Pachypanchax, I hear the same story. They used to be abundant, then the Pyrene, which is the Malagasy word for gambusia, came, and now they have either very rare or they, they've disappeared completely. And given the fact that we have documented the effect of gambusia as fry predators in other parts of the world, I don't see any reason why they would behave any differently in Madagascar. The sword tails were introduced by Jacques Arnault, the person who introduced both the Madagascar rainbow and his namesake, Paki Panchax, the aquarium hobby. In his own words, I introduced them to cleanse the waters. I have no idea what he thought he was cleansing the waters of. But the simple fact of the matter is this is an introduction that succeeded altogether too well. The green sword tail is now the most common small freshwater fish in Madagascar. It is virtually ubiquitous in any fast flowing body of water. The platys, as near as we can tell, were spin-offs from the aquarium hobby. Uh, prior to independence, there was a fairly large expatriate French population in Madagascar. They did have an aquarium club in Tenerive, and as near as we can tell, one of these people who wanted to have a reliable population of platys at his disposal introduced these animals into the headwaters of the Betsy Boca River and the headwaters of the Rianila. Uh, they have done very well for themselves. They are now quite common in low, in low altitude habitats along the entire east coast of Madagascar. Uh, most of them look like this. They've reverted to the basic gray wild platyfish type. But you still have populations where somewhere between two and three percent of the animals are red. 
And I, I'm told by people that know that fish in Belize and southern Mexico, that's about the same ratio that you find red animals in the wild in their native habitat. And unlike the gambusia and the guppies, where we do have direct observations of predation upon fry, that doesn't seem to be what's going on with the swordtail and the platys. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any indication that the adults are preying directly on the fry of other fish. But given the fact that baby live bearers at birth are as large as a six-week-old Bedodia or Pachypanchax fry, I suspect the problem is the live bearer babies just outcompete the fry of the native fish for available food resources. Then we have the snakehead. Uh, this was the project of the former dictator and president of Madagascar, uh, Etienne Rasiraka. Uh, he saw these fish on a state visit to North Korea. And in Korea and China, this species is used as a control predator to, to keep tilapia from overpopulating fish ponds. It's native there, so if it gets loose, it isn't the end of the world. Uh, Ratsiraka apparently fell in love with this fish for the same reason that some people like pit bulls. It's just the baddest fish out there. He came back to Madagascar, called the director of the fishery service into his office, and said, I want you to arrange for the importation of this fish from China. And the director, to, who deserves, I think, a great deal of credit for his honesty and his courage, said, Mr. President, this is not a good idea because everywhere in the world where these fish have been introduced, they have had a very detrimental effect on, on our local fisheries. So the president thanked him for his advice, and the director of the fishery service left, assuming that he'd scotched this idea in the bud. And a month later, a transport plane arrived from China containing two boxes of snakehead fingerlings, gift from the People's Republic of China to the president of the Popular Republic of Madagascar. Ratsiraka dumped one box of fingerlings in the fish ponds in the presidential summer residence in the headwaters of the westward flowing Betsy Boca River. He sent the other box of fingerlings to his family home on the east coast on the other side of the hydrological divide. So we got them on both coasts of Madagascar at one fell swoop. What happened, of course, is that during the rainy season, the ponds flooded, the fish got out, and from that point on, it's been Katie barred the door. One of the factors that has spread this fish quite widely in Madagascar is that Malagasy's of Chinese descent esteem the snakehead as a food fish. They feel because it is a very powerful fish, it contains a great deal of chi, a great deal of life force. Uh, and every place where I have been able to trace the introduction date or the appearance date of snakeheads into a given area, the, the answer that I get is always the same. Mr. Wang or Mr. Chu or Mr. Lee brought a box of these fish into his fish pond and from that point on, we have fibata in the rivers. The only parts of Madagascar where you do not have snakeheads are areas where, for whatever reason, historical reason, local commerce is in the hands of people of Bangladeshi descent. These people are Muslims. Snakehead is not halal. It is not a clean fish. And these people have no, no tradition of aquaculture. So they've had no motivation to bring the fish in. And in these parts of Madagascar, you still have rivers where you don't have snakeheads. But everywhere where local commerce is in the hands of people of Chinese ancestry, you have the snakehead. This is a nice example of what I call ethnographic introduction ecology. And the problem, of course, is that once you get a species introduced into an area, you don't get rid of it easily if you get rid of it at all. And as I say, the, the fish that's sort of the poster child for all these problems is Pachypanchax saccharamii. Yellow areas are historical. Red areas are historical. Green are the only places where the animal still occurs. And this contraction of range has taken place since about, 19, 19, since about 1919. And again, the factors are deforestation of the watershed, so the stream becomes intermittent, and predation on fry by gambusia and by guppies. So how do we conserve freshwater biodiversity of Madagascar? Well, the ideal approach is to conserve viable fish communities in the habitats where they're native. And the poster example of success in this area is the Nocivola River at Marulambo. This is basically the holy grail if you're interested in Malagasy freshwater fish. Because within a, a, an hour's walk of this village, you can find 12 endemic species. There is nowhere else in Madagascar where you have such a high diversity of endemic species. Uh, there's an endemic rainbow fish. There are two endemic genera of cichlids, Catria and Oxalapia. Um, there's an endemic catfish. 
Uh, there are several Bedodiids, Rheocles species, the other Bedodia genus. Uh, it's just an amazing area. And because the water is crystal clear, assuming you can keep from chilling out because the water temperature is in the 70s, and I can assure you if you spend any amount of water time underwater there, you get real cold real fast, even if the air temperature is in the 90s, you can basically put a face mask on and just basically see these animals doing their, their thing in nature. And there are very few places in Madagascar where that's possible. Largely due to the work of the Durrell Foundation, and I must say that Rick Hefner of the Denver Zoo and myself deserve a certain amount of credit for initially sensitizing the locals to the fact that their fish are something special, uh, the local people have become very protective of that habitat. They have adopted uh, Oxalapia poli as the official mascot of the village. Uh, Oxalapia's Malagasy name is Songatan. They basically have an annual festival of the Songatan, which takes place during the month of July. And this is near as I can tell as an excuse to barbecue a cow and get blind stinking drunk with a local rot gut. But again, I don't care what the motivation is. If it makes people behave in a responsible manner towards their environment and helps to conserve the fish, I'm all for it. Uh, the local fishermen have voluntarily set aside the months of December, January, and February as a closed season. They don't fish during those months because that's when the cichlids breed. And the Durrell Foundation is trying to get local people to maintain a strip of uncultivated land about a meter wide if their field comes right down to the river. And that band of uncultivated land will effectively trap any sediment that might wash off their field and otherwise get into the stream. So things are actually working reasonably well here. And it would be nice if we could duplicate the Marulambo experience everywhere in Madagascar, but it just ain't going to happen. So if we're serious about saving these fish in the near term, the alternative is some kind of captive breeding program. And while the results have been decidedly mixed, on the whole, we've had our successes. And captive breeding works. It's not an ideal solution, but as an intervention, a short-term intervention, to keep something from going extinct, it does. Uh, a number of examples, uh, the Monterey Plates of Phosphorus cuchianus. For most of the last quarter of the 20th, 20th century, virtually all the Monterey Plates in the world lived in the Osborne Laboratories of Marine Science at the New York Aquarium. And the reason for that is the late Dr. Myron Gordon thought that fish had potential interest as a genetic subject, brought breeding stock back to New York, and the fish did very well for themselves. We no longer have them in New York, but the, the study collection was cloned and sent to the University of Texas at Austin, and the animals are still doing very well there. They no longer exist in their native Mexico. Uh, the white cloud is a critically endangered species in China, and it no longer exists in the type locality, White Cloud Mountain, but it's in no danger of going globally extinct. There are probably more white clouds produced for the aquarium trade in Southeast Asia and Florida than ever existed in the wild in southern China. Another success story are a number of Lake Victoria haplochromines. These are being maintained by an AZA-sanctioned SSP, and an even larger number are in the hobby and being very actively maintained by hobbyists. And finally, the topaz cichlid, a species I described from the Sixaola River in Costa Rica. I had no idea at the time that I described or the time I brought it back it would ever become endangered, but it has, and it's in very serious trouble in Costa Rica. But again, it's in no danger globally because it's, it is in the hobby on both sides of the Atlantic. And if the situation that led to its endangerment in Costa Rica would ever be mi mitigated, there's no reason that we couldn't put them back. We've had some successes in Madagascar as well. Although I don't consider it to be particularly threatened, the, Mal the Madagascar rainbow, Bedodia madagascariensis, is a classic example of how becoming a popular aquarium fish can do you a great deal of good from the conservation standpoint. Uh, Jacques Arnault brought 12 pair of these fish back to Paris in 1958. All the aquarium Madagascariensis in the world are descended from those fish. And I would say conservatively that again, more of these animals are produced for the aquarium trade annually than exist on the ground or in the water in Madagascar. Becoming a popular aquarium fish, if you're a small colorful tropical species, means you become the beneficiary of a self-financing captive breeding program. Uh, Pachypanchex saccharamii, another success. Uh, this animal is being maintained institutionally on both sides of the Atlantic, and it's in the organized Killy hobby in Europe and the UK and the United States as well. So again, I, I worry about saccharamii in Madagascar, but if worse comes to worse and we lose it in Madagascar, we, at least we haven't lost it globally. We do have a managed population to fall back on. 
cichlid wise, paratriplus menorambo, this is a big, large, quite large cichlid, most paratriplus are. Uh, this animal was discovered by Jean Claude Nourissat and Patrick Durham in the late 1990s. Uh, I brought specimens of this fish back for Leif de Mason in Florida. Leif has bred it successfully. The year after we brought our breeding stock back, Jean Claude and Patrick went back to the local collecting locality and were told by the fishermen there that the fish had was gone. Le poisson est disparu, the fish has disappeared. And for many years, we thought the animal was extinct in the wild, and it was only the wild population or the managed population that kept it going. About five years ago, we discovered a relict population in an isolated lake in the same river basin. So the animal status went from extinct in the wild to critically endangered. Only in Madagascar does that qualify as good news. Uh, the other species that we've had success with is Tychochromus insulidus. This is another Sophia basin endemic. It lives in the same habitat as the Sophia pachypanchac. <coughs> Uh, again, very, very seriously threatened because of habitat degradation. And fortunately, we were able to get founder stock of this species uh, into the hands of our sino malagasy collaborator, Guy Tamyok. Guy has an extensive fish culture facility in, uh, in uh, uh, eastern Madagascar in the basin uh, of Andapa. And Guy has bred these successfully and dispersed fry to a number of aquariums in Europe and North America. So again, if conditions improve in the Sophia, or we can find an area uh, in that basin that's protected from some of the stressors, there is no reason that we couldn't put them back. The problem, of course, is that while we've had a couple of successes, there's still an awful lot of fish out there that we have no experience of at all. Have not, not, not only have we not bred them, in many cases, we don't even know how they breed. Uh, classical example of this, the endemic catfish the Ancarians, two genera, Ancarius and, and, Gog, and Gug. We have no idea how these animals breed. According to the Malagasy, the catfish are mouth brooders, male mouth brooders, and that's plausible because the sister family of the Ancariidae are the sea catfish, the areas, the area and they're all male mouth brooders. And we do know that these animals have only one functional ovary. The eggs are few in number. The largest number we ever measured were 85 eggs, and they're huge. They're as large as salmon eggs, which suggests that they're, either, they're providing some kind of parental care, because if you're investing that much energy and that few eggs, you don't just scatter them into the environment. So it's probable, it's possible, it's even probable that these are mouth brooders. But until we bring them into captivity and actually spawn them, we just don't know. In many cases, the problem we've run into is just getting broodstock out of the country. We went through a period in Madagascar where the government was not at all sympathetic to the notion of taking wild animals out. Uh, and it took a number of political changes before the personnel of the Serbis de Pesh altered sufficiently so that we could go back to a reasonable policy of exporting live animals. So there's, there is no inherent reason why we couldn't do the Doro Aloza species in captivity. We just need broodstock to work with. In other cases, we have brought the animals into captivity and bred them, but we have yet to work out a viable protocol for long-term maintenance. Reocles is the other Bedodia genus. They're all high altitude fish. They may live geographically in the tropics, but they're really cool water fish. And what we discovered the hard way when we brought Reocles aloatrensis back to New York and Denver is that if you don't have a chiller on the tank or an air condition in the fish room, you lose these animals during the summer. So Toronto is working with this species, Reocles vatosu now. They have an F1 generation. They are aware of the problem with water temperature we'll see whether they can work out a protocol that allows us to keep the animal around on a long-term basis. And then finally, we have the problem of the fish that I call the living dead, uh, Tychochromus species. These animals used to be abundant enough to support a targeted fishery and an important one. They are now so rare that the likelihood of being able to collect enough founders to establish a genetically viable captive population with the resources at our disposal are effectively nil. Uh, there's one place that used to collect, the, that used to harvest somewhere between three and four tons of these fish a year. And the last time that Jean-Claude and Patrick were down there talking to the fishermen, the fishermen were telling them they were lucky if they catch two or three a year. Well, when the fish is that rare, the logistics of collecting enough founders to establish a breeding population just become insurmountably complex. So these animals are still around, but how much longer, I wouldn't want to take a bet on. 
and they're certainly not an animal that I would invest a great deal of emotional capital in trying to save. I just don't think, frankly, we're at the point now where that's possible. So we could be, sometimes you feel you're looking at the sunset for Malagasy fish. But those of us that work in Madagascar are insurmountable optimists. If we weren't, we should have jumped off of tall buildings or cut our throats a long time ago. The Malagasy are a very poetic people. They have a poetic form called a Heinteni. And this is a Heinteni that the Durrell Foundation had on their Christmas card one year, which I've shamelessly plagiarized from my closing slide. And frankly, these, are, these sentiments pretty much express the mindset that all of us that do conservation and work in Madagascar have. Uh, you have to be optimistic. And in the case of fish, unlike animals like lemurs, for example, reintroducing fish is dead easy. You just need to produce enough of them to make repeated efforts until it works. Lemurs, that's another story. Someday, if you want me to, I will tell you the story of our attempt to broaden the genetic basis of a population of black and white rough lemurs in eastern Madagascar and how much that project cost us in time, effort, and money. And believe me, compared to this, fish are dead easy. So maintaining viable captive populations of these animals is not necessarily a dead end from the conservation standpoint. Reintroduction of fishes is possible, it's doable, and it's not even necessarily that expensive. And we as hobbyists can play a role in this. Maintaining viable populations of a lot of these small fish is a lot easier if you have a collaborative effort involving both hobbyists and institutions. It's very, very difficult for a single zoo or a single public aquarium to maintain a large enough population of any of these fish to avoid inbreeding problems. But if you have a meta population where you had two or three zoos and aquariums and perhaps 50 or 60 hobbyists in North America and Europe working with these fish, all of a sudden you have a meta population that's large enough to avoid problems with inbreeding depression. So this is a case, this is an area where we as hobbyists can play an important role in aiding a conservation effort. So on that note, thank you for listening.